Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I'm Joel. And you know Jamie. We thought we would try to get her here at least for the beginning and she's already over us. She will be <laughs> circling us like a shark while we film because it's approaching her dinner time and she's very concerned that we are going to forget. So, and by the way, I should mention, this is not a person lurking outside our window. <laughs> that is a Halloween decoration that hangs there and which Jamie hates and which periodically scares me because <laughs> during the day I work, sometimes I just look up and I'm like, ah, anyway, we are here today to do a reading wrap up for the month of October, talk about the books that we read. It was a weird reading month because I don't know if you've heard this. We were in Italy. You went to Italy? I did. Did you go? I did too. Oh, we wow. should have. We should have met up together. We're annoying. We're annoying. <laughs> we were, we have made it our goal in life to be insufferable about the fact that we were in Italy. We've actually been pretty good. We have. We joke to each other that we're going to be insufferable about it. Oh, but I don't yeah. think we really have. No. But so the first thing we want to talk about is actually since uh, you were not here to participate in the book haul that I did for October, which I'll link down below. I thought it would be fun to talk about some of your Italian souvenirs. They're all book books. So so I wanted to have some fun and get a nice Italian cookbooks to put on my cookbook shelf. Yeah. So um, this is kind of a really fun concept. Col Colazioni? Diatore. Diatore. It's, so um, Colazioni is breakfast, breakfast and the author is like, I guess, of the author. I don't speak author. Italian very well. Yeah, so we should have Googled that. But, we should have. Um, but it's really kind of cool because they are um, dessert recipes from movies. Yeah. But they will have like different uh, recipes in here from different movies. Yeah, and, um, all, and books. And books. Yeah. But there is, let's find a good... Um, American exactly. book that is a really because there's a really some fun movies in here yeah that we had seen I think fried green tomatoes in here yeah which I read not too oh. long ago so here's Jane Eyre Jane Eyre and it looks like it's a bunt cake a boont a boont I really wish you were all here I wish this was a scratch and sniff because I have a bunt cake in the oven right now he so does Greg bought me some nice new bunt pans and so I'm making a Apple cider donut bunt. So Be, because fall. There's a hole in it. There's a hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it smells amazing. So anyway, this was a really fun cookbook. Yeah. Uh, mixes movies, books, and food and everything I yeah. love. So we got that at a bookstore in Bologna called Libraria Train. T R A M E. And yeah. the, the the owner actually knows the author of that cookbook and says she's a lovely person. Very so, nice. So yeah. And then of course I needed a chocolate book. Yes. Chocolato. Chocolato. And it's all um, chocolate recipes. Everything is in Italian, so I will have to translate it. But I thought they were both beautiful covers. Yeah. And I was very excited um, of adding this into my collection. And what was really fun when we got that one is that we went to a restaurant that was recommended by my cousin. My cousin took us to this restaurant. And the owner of that restaurant is one of the founders and uh, involved somewhere at the top level of this slow food movement, which has the, the snail logo on it. So we didn't know that. So Joel had this cookbook while we were in the restaurant and the waiter, who was the son of the woman who owns the restaurant, like pointed at it and was like, what's that? And we got to explain and it was fun. And so he had this all over his menu. Yeah. So his menu had this and it's like, I don't know what this logo is, mm -hmm. but it was kind of, it meant that everything was like locally sourced yeah. and um, local stuff. So it's really kind of cool. It I was, was very excited. I got this book for like $8. Yeah. The books were really cheap in <clears throat> Italy, not going to lie. And uh, the other thing that's nice about it is, the, so the measurements are largely the same as you would find in American cookbooks. It's yeah. just the process that's in Italian. Or gr everything's in grams, which I cook in yeah. grams anyway, so it's yeah. very easy for me. Uh, then the last is uh, we took a cooking class. Yes. And um, it was so much fun from Buca de Bacco. Bu Buca de Bacco. And um, it was right there in our village. It was really cool. There was like 12 of us. We all cooked. We made uh, eggplant parmigiano. Which was good. We made a red sauce. We made pizza dough and um, a chocolate cake. May, before you continue, may I for a moment toot my own horn? I have never managed to make a round pizza. <laughs> and when they showed us how to do it, I was like, this is going to be a mess. I made the prettiest round pizza. Of you had anyone. the roundest pizza of everybody in I that did. class. It they was... took mine to use as the demo 
<laughs> and that will never happen again. Yeah. So. Um, but anyway, um, it was um, everything that we did in the class. They had the little recipes here in English. Yeah. And um, we were like with 12 other people. And it, it's really a great group. We got along it really was. well with everybody. Really sweet. And a lot of um, common bonds between us. And it was fun. But um, I made gnocchi from here. And the gnocchi recipe is phenomenal. Yes. Uh, can you add a link to the gnocchi recipe? Yeah, we can put okay, it down I'll below. I'll put that down below. Yeah. It was so good. You did a gorgonzola. Gorgonzola and cream sauce. And cream sauce with crumbled pistachios on top. It was oh, really so good. It was really good. So good. And yeah. Gnocchi. Gnocchi. So it was this was fun. really treasured too. I loved it. And we learned some interesting things <laughs> because they put a potato in the pesto, which... Kind of keeps it from oxidizing. Mm -hmm. So if you put a potato in the pesto, anything green, mm -hmm. a potato, like a a mashed potato mm -hmm. in guacamole, it'll keep it from turning brown. Yeah. Who knows? And you don't really taste the potato, but yeah. it's actually a very cool idea. So And we had beautiful green pesto. So green. So green. Were you in Italy? I was in Italy. He was in yeah. Italy. <laughs> and then the other thing was, I, I already showed these in my book haul for the month of October but I figured one of them was actually picked out by Joel yeah I needed that book yeah Call, Call Me By Your by Name me. in Italian in Italian Chiamami Col Tuo Nome I don't know if I pronounced that correctly but we're gonna go with it anyway so that was Joel's pick from the bookstores probably my my all time favorite book of, yeah. I mean like all times and I love this book so much hated the movie thank you and I forgot that it was your favorite book when we did our blindfolded book challenge, <laughs> which I'll link down below as well. So that was embarrassing. <laughs> so, oh, and then I had gotten a copy of The Great Gatsby. Not, I mean, I love the book. It's not one of my favorites. It's just really pretty. It's a really pretty cover. And really I just pretty. read that right before we left. You did, yeah. And I got a copy of Beloved in Italian, because I love Toni Morrison. And she's going to be on a stamp. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I'll get stamps for us. I want one of those. And uh, Maurice or Morris, if you're in the UK, by E.M. Forster. <laughs> I read so. that right before we left, too. You did. It's <laughs> all very timely and coming together. Yeah. So that is a, that covers the trip a little bit, unless there's anything else you want to add about the trip. I don't think so. We had a really great time. I know Greg has kind of covered everything. So yeah. uh, I appreciate everybody wishing us have fun and relax and yeah. good and travels. So thank you, everybody. And I, I mentioned that we got home a day early because Jamie was sick. Obviously, she's doing better. She's doing really good. She's feisty, and that's good to see. Yeah. And she's putting up, she's gaining weight again, and that's lovely, lovely. Yes, so. we're very happy about that. Yes. So there are actually three books that I read in the month of September that didn't get covered in our September wrap-up, which we filmed before we left, so we filmed it a little early. One of them was a total surprise, and then two of them I read on the plane, because we left for Italy on September 28th. So right. they're technically September books, but they weren't in the last wrap-up, so I'm going to include them here. Uh, the first one is Blackout by various authors. Danielle Clayton, Tiffany D. Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and Nic Nicola Yoon. This is, so they all write... Some of them are shorter stories, and some of them are a little bit longer and more stretched out throughout the book. But all of them involve a blackout in New York City, and all the characters end up or were already intending to go to a party in Brooklyn. They're all kind of romantic stories. And it's a cute book. I feel like I don't have a whole lot to say about it, but it is a really cute book, and I enjoyed it. So I, I just don't know that I have much more to add about it that I haven't said. It's one yeah. that I'd like to read. I mean, yeah. it's in New York. It's in a sixth floor walk up. Yeah. That blackout. So everything we kind of um, experienced. Yeah. So yeah. it sounds like a fun book. Yeah, and it is. It's a, it's a very cute book. It is, I think, YA. Uh, so it was fun. Um, and then on the plane, I read. I'm going to go do another one if you don't mind no, no, yeah. no. and then on the plane I read La Bastarda by Tifonia Melivia Obono translated by Lawrence Schimmel this was one of the three books that was selected for the end of year for the LGBTQ plus in translation read along and it's only 88 pages so I actually read the ebook on the plane I downloaded it from Scribd and I had already ordered a copy from Montana Book Company and it came so I picked it up it, it, it's a good book uh, I think it does a really great job setting up a very interesting story about a family in Equatorial Guinea and the difference in what you want from your own life and including um, your sexuality and what society expects you to do. It sets up a really interesting story about that. Ultimately, it doesn't do much with that. Again, it's only 88 pages, but I did enjoy it and we've had some interesting conversation with about it 
in the LGBTQ plus in translation read along, which I'll have the details of that down below as well. And then there was one other book that I read on the plane. Um, do you want to do one of yours sure. first? Or, yeah. uh, the one I read on the plane was One Italian Summer by Rebecca Cyril. I wonder why he was reading that. I know. As we were going to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually very interesting because the author really did, we were going to Positano, and the book takes place in Positano. Mm. And they talk about the um, the hotel they stayed in. We actually went by the mm. restaurant they ate at. We went by. So it's actually, I did get a little feel of Positano before we got there. And it's like, oh, that was in my book. Oh, that was in my book. He did say that a lot. I did say that a lot. <laughs> and so fun. it was kind of fun. Yeah. But it was a good book. It's a um, woman who um, lost her husband and uh, one or lost her mother I'm sorry and her and her mother were supposed to go on this vacation together but she goes without her mother and kind of relives what her mother grew up doing because her mother grew up in Positano mm -hmm. and uh, or went, to, co or went to, co went to college or spent time there okay and um, but in her 20s was in Positano mm -hmm. so she kind of learned a lot about her mother after her mother died about her youth in Positano it was sweet oh, it was fun. nice yeah, yeah. And actually, it, it's interesting as well, because when we met up with my cousin who lives in Rome, she, my mother's family is from Italy, and she had met up with some of my mother's family and heard stories about my mother, who visited Italy a lot. It, like when she was, a, my mother was the oldest uh, in her family, so when she was a kid into her adolescence, they went to, back to Italy every summer. So she really got to know the family better than her siblings ever did, so they had a lot of stories about her, and that was interesting as well. Yeah. So, um... So the other book that I finished on the plane on the way there, because we had a big layover in Paris. Paris. And actually, the, the, while we were in Paris is where I listened to the bulk of this. It's Love and Saffron by Kim Fake. This was a really cute book. And it, I kind of timed it because we were going to be in Paris. I think they go to Paris at one point in the book. It's mostly an epistolary novel. So it's in letters back and forth between two women. Uh, there is one part of it that is not a letter. It's actual narrative. Um, and it's a really cute story. So the premise is... Uh, again, there are two women. It's set in the early 1960s, definitely 1963, because the Kennedy assassination happens during the course of their letters back and forth. And uh, it all begins when one of them, I think her name is Joan, sends a letter to Imogen, who is a writer she knows who lives in the Seattle area, and she includes a gift of saffron with it. And they start exchanging letters back and forth, and Imogen is not very experienced in the world of food at all and this, this gift of saffron kind of opens her world and expands her horizons in the, the way of food kind of like you did to me and Joan is an aspiring writer and journalist and she kind of is moving her way into becoming like a food writer which is something that in 1963 didn't quite exist and wasn't necessarily something a woman could do so she's moving into that path and Imogen is older and uh, it's just a really cute story. They form this really powerful, unexpected friendship for both of them, and it becomes a pivotal friendship in their lives moving forward. And it's a really cute book. It's very short. It's like three, four hours, and uh, I, I, you would probably like it. No, it is my so, next after I finish my yeah. current. It's a cute book, and I don't want to say too much more about it because I want him to read it. <laughs> so, uh, But it's a, it's a very cute book, and that was a perfect way to read it because um, it was very perfectly distracting on a plane and all that and then we were in Italy for two weeks I don't know if we mentioned that but <laughs> I didn't read anything I didn't read a thing yeah so for the first half of October neither one of us really read much of anything so when we got home it took me about a week to rev up and get back into the world of reading I eventually did that and had an, a really unexpectedly strong finish to the month, and you kind of... I did okay. You did good. Uh, you spent a little, a lot more time kind of casually working back into it. Right. Um, so the first book that I finished, I had started this on the way home, but I didn't finish it until we got back. It's Winter Love by Han Su Yin, and I really love this. Again, it's a short book. I'm really into short books right now, and it is a really good story about two women who are in sort of college age in World War II in England. It was published in 1962. That's the part about it that really made me feel like I had to have a copy for the library. And so they are in love, but of course there are lots of complications to their romance at 
due to the details and constraints of the time. Also, it's World War II, so it really deals with austerity. There are interesting parallels between their situation. It gave me feelings of Patricia Highsmith's The Price of Salt, which was turned into the movie Carol, because it really dives into their psyches, and it's all, there are ways in which it almost feels like a psychological thriller. And they don't always get along. The main character, whose nickname is Red, lashes out a lot when she gets angry, but Han Su Yin does a great job making you feel why she would feel like that and why she would be angry about these things and why some of that is just her personality. And it's really interesting. And Han Su Yin didn't write anything else that had LGBTQ plus elements. This is like the only one, but it's really well observed and interesting. And I would recommend it to a lot of people. And I just felt like I had to have a copy. So I immediately called Montana Book Company. It's a beautiful copy too. It is a beautiful, it reflects a lot of light. So I don't know if you can see there are two women, one completely in shadow, smoking a cigarette. Um, but it captures the tone and feel of the book really <clears throat> nicely. So, so that was the first book I finished when we got home. Do you want to do one of yours or should sure. I keep going? So my first book when we got back was one I was really waiting for. was The Winners by Frederick Bachman. Mm -hmm. It was a third in the series of the Beartown series. Uh, so he wrote Beartown, Us Against You, and then... The winners. It's a trilogy of a nice hockey team up in Sweden, uh, and it's been translated. Uh, the book is really good. Uh, there's a lot of a little controversy about it. So the first book is about a rape of a girl and a hockey player, and that kind of doesn't get resolved, but it goes into the hockey. And I wish they would have concentrated more the rape and put that to bed, but they didn't. It kind of goes along through the next two books. And then it just gets very strong into hockey in the second book. And then the third book is all the repercussions from starting with the rape all the way through the hockey of fights and people getting killed. And every chapter there's a twist and there's a turn. Just when you think it's all over, something else happens. It's a little grim ending. Um, the woman who was raped um, has some closure and puts a little bit of perspective, not perspective, but she actually has a little payback. Mm -hmm. She actually turns out to be a really great older person who kind of pulled her life together and did something and got out of this town, which was nothing but hockey and beer. I think as a whole series, the book is really good. Mm -hmm. um, the final one really was a tearjerker, made me cry. There's so many characters and so many layers to it. Um, it was a beautiful series. I yes. really liked it. And so. your stepmother My read it right before you did. Yeah. And she said that it's probably going to be her favorite book of the year. Yeah. So, so she liked it a lot too. Um, really good series. I enjoyed it. Um, I do. I know some of the controversy is how they handled the rape. I wish they would have put a little bit more emphasis on tying that together, but it does all tie together and it was really good. So. Yeah, I guess when the first book comes out, you wouldn't know that. Oh, oh. so we are gonna have to pause because- cake My is cake ready. is ready. Yeah. Okay, be we'll back. We'll be back. <laughs> okay, we're back and Jamie is eating. The cake smells <laughs> amazing. S scratch your screen and sniff, it will work. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, so was anything else about winners? Nope, it was good. It was I liked good? it. Okay. Uh, so my next book was The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gundy. I worked my way through that one kind of slowly. It starts a little slow. I listened to it on audio, and actually Tess Gundy reads, I think, the majority of the audio herself, but there are other voices because it's set in a housing comp an affordable housing complex in Vacaville, Indiana, which is a fictional town. And she reads the majority of it, and she kind of sounds bored, and that makes it a little hard to get into, but... Over time, as the story starts to develop and build and grow, and you sort of start to realize that it's sort of like that boredom that comes from depression, it starts to feel appropriate. And it really ended up being, a, I'd say, a very powerful book, a bit of a messy book. There are a lot of characters who live in this affordable housing complex. Some of them really tie into the story well and have powerful stories. Like there's a mother who's suffering from postpartum depression. There's an older couple that starts out, they are kind of blaming kids who just aged out of the foster pro program who live above them for some weird things that are going on in the apartment complex. But that storyline kind of disappears throughout the entire middle of the book. So there's a little too much going on. 
But it's a really interesting and powerful book. It talks a lot about this town is sort of economically depressed. It used to be uh, a place where there was a car factory and that obviously has moved away in the way that has happened to a lot of American cities. And that has left the city economically depressed. The people who live there are economically depressed and actually depressed. And the main character, in as much as there is one, is a, uh, one of the kids who age out of the foster program. Her name is Blondie, and she's 18, and she's obsessed with the mystics. And there are a lot of parallels between, like, religion and interesting dualities in the book. I've been thinking about it a lot since I finished it, which I think says a lot. But, uh, yeah, I'd say it's a little messy, but it is a very good book and one that I'm going to be really thinking about a lot. So, uh, it is a finalist for the National Book Award. We'll have to see if it ends up winning. But uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot, and I'm thinking about it a lot, which is, you really can't pay any book a higher compliment than that. So, cool. that was my next one. Uh, my next one was The First to Die in the End. It is a prequel to They Both Die in the End. Uh, sounds like a very grim uh, title. It does. <laughs> uh, by Adam Silva. Um, I really love these books. Um, I like the first one. I like the second one. So the first one was these two guys meet. There's a, it's fantasy, obviously. Uh, there's a program called Deathcast that will call you at midnight on the day you're going to die so you can get your affairs in orders. Uh, you can sign up for it or not do it. Um so the first book was the two guys, um, they both get the phone call, they're gonna die, and they go off. The second book, which is the prequel, is how did death cast get started? And this guy who had a computer program, who um, they never tell you the secret of how it works, but he knows when you're gonna die. So this was like, who was the first person to be called and how did they die? Um, it was, uh, a great story. I I don't really do fantasy that much, but um, it was really really sweet. Um, it is a LGBTQ um, based story, and um, how these two guys meet and kind of fall in love, and one's gonna die, and one will die soon, but not by death cast. He has a bad heart and um it's just a beautiful story i just i had a lot of fun reading that so. yeah um who else liked the first one was it L lona lona liked it mm -hmm. um our my stepmother and then our friend leon liked it mm -hmm. and then in our book club which we'll talk about later uh, when i brought up that i was reading it everybody got excited yeah so um, i mean I, at some point i'll do it i just I, maybe next year yeah. I, don't, I, I don't think i can deal with a book about impending death right now yeah <laughs> so, it's good for you a little <laughs> grim but yeah. in a good way yeah sure. that's it's a thing okay we'll do yeah. that so uh great read I, I recommend it so my next book was something that i almost didn't finish it was something that i started on the plane wasn't really enjoying and just kind of put to the side and that's when i turned to winter love and then i didn't <laughs> think i was going to finish it but once I was done with Rabbit, I just, just thought, you know, why don't I just soldier on, get through it, and it'll be fine. It's A Merry Little Meet Cute by Julie Murphy and Sierra Simone. It sounded cute. It sounded good. interesting. If you know both of us, really, not just me. Like, holiday romances, that's our thing. We're into it. And this is a holiday romance, but it's also a bit of a twist on your traditional holiday romance because it is very, like, sex positive. The female protagonist is a porn star and the male protagonist is, was the bad boy in a boy band but it turns out he's not actually the bad boy it was just an image thing and the, the book that's another thing that's a little weird about it the book kind of works hard to make it sure that you know they're both good people despite what they have done in the past but it's also really aggressive and trying so hard on every page like even at one point the female protagonist is commenting on like a good thing happens to her and she's like it felt really satisfying like when your emergency stash of sex toys comes in handy and it's like okay not a prude but you need to calm down like it's just it reminds you of these things on every single page and it doesn't need to be that hardcore about it so i did finish it was it worth it not really but i did finish so it is what it is now do you want me to keep going or do you want to do another one Oh, if you got one, go for it. Yeah. So then I did, this is where we head into the last week, which was a big one for me. I actually finished a lot of books. 
They by Kay Dick was the next one that I finished. I was looking for something that would have sort of Halloween vibes, and this is like LGBTQ plus Halloween vibes. So it's about, it was published in 1977, like immediately forgotten, and now they're trying to uh, have, get it rediscovered. Kay Dick was a lesbian, and the story here is that it's set in a world where people are trying to live their lives, but there are hordes of people known as they or them who sort of police them. And if you aren't towing the line, and if you don't take a warning from them and start behaving in the way they want you to behave, they will really violently punish you, or you might just disappear. And that comes out there. There is at least one dog that dies in the book. Um, and so trigger warnings for that. But basically what it's, it, it feels kind of relevant to today's world because you have a lot of people from a conservative mindset who want like to ban books and things like that. So it feels a little all too real right now. And the people who are really <clears throat> being targeted are artists and What's interesting about it is that the protagonist of the book, you don't know their gender. It's never mentioned. You don't know their name uh, or anything like that. So it kind of lets you play with the story in ways that there could be queer elements as well. And it, let it lets it feel a little bit re resonant for that as well. So it was a really interesting book. And again, another really short one. I, again, I've been into short books lately. So that was a fun one. And... Do you want to go or should I do another? Sure. You're just trying to catch up with me, aren't you? I am. Reading short books. Yeah. <laughs> My um, book I'll probably finish tonight is called The Gunkle, uh, Gay Uncle. Uh, it's I. It's a really sweet book, yeah. but it got very serious today when I was um, I was baking the cake. I had it going, and it's like, what got really serious? Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And... Um, I, because I thought it was going to be this this fun light book, mm -hmm. but uh, which it is, and uh, it's about this gay man whose brother is going into rehab and says, "Can you take my two kids for the next five weeks?" And so he's like, he lives in Palm Springs, mm -hmm. and he only does brunch or lupper, and so he has to teach the kids what brunch means and what lupper means, and trying to teach these kids his way of life, and mm -hmm. he's now beginning to learn their way of life and understanding a kid's point of view. Mm. Um, absolutely sweet. So um, my best friend, she just adopted a fostering. Foster to adopt. Foster to adopt mm. permanently has um, a little girl. So I've just become Uncle Joel and Uncle Greg. Yeah. So I was like, I have to do this book. Yeah. And um, it's absolutely charming. I just love it. Yeah. So. It, it, a lot of people have recommended this book over the last year to both of us. Yeah. And I'm glad one of us is finally <laughs> getting to it. Well, every, I had it on hold with Libby, our um, service for books. And every time I started a book, it says, oh, um, Gunkle's ready. Yeah. And it's like, postpone. Yeah. And I started a new book, postpone. Finally, I was like, no, I'll read Gunkle because people are waiting for it and I got to get it done. So I'm glad I am. It's perfect. Yeah. And I have done exactly that with Libby <laughs> <laughs> many, many, many times. Yeah. So three books for the month of October, but they've been all great books. Yeah. So my next book, I have a couple more that I read. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time about them, but uh, the next one I read was Lavender House by Lev A.C. Rosen. Here's a fun fact that I didn't mention in my Friday Reads video with this. I actually almost gave up on this book in the first chapter. And you convinced me to give it a chance and keep going. And Jamie's barking at something. She says, yes, Daddy, read it. She says, yes, read it. <laughs> so basically what happened, it's, a, it's described as a queer Knives Out. I would say Knives Out is the wrong comparison because Knives Out to me is like a funny thing and really like kind of action packed and propels you through. It's a little bit more of a slow burn mystery, more like a classic like Agatha Christie one. Knives Out was a bad comparison. And the thing about it is the narrator is doing this really growly like Batman, you know, like, I'm Batman voice as he reads. And I found that incredibly annoying. So for the first chapter, what? What's wrong with Batman? <laughs> <laughs> so for the whole first chapter, I was like, I don't think I can do this. I really did. And then we talked about it. And what did you say? 
Well, I just I told him to stick with it because a, a narrator can really be annoying, mm. but then when you get into the story, it's making sense of why he's doing this. Mm. So I think he is trying to be this growly, deep voice getting into this murder mystery thing. So you were right, because then in the next chapter, you start meeting all of the other people who are going to be the suspects in the mystery, and they all have different voices. voices. So you meet the other characters, and it sort of calms down a little bit. It does always. Like, he's supposed to be a sort of manly man, and I guess that's another thing it's kind of going for. So he's the, he's has been a police officer, and he gets caught doing a lewd act with a man in a bathroom of a gay bar and gets forced off of the police force. And actually, I didn't mention this in the Friday Raids either. That is something that's interesting. And I mentioned that, uh, I did mention that it plays with the idea of like safe spaces for queer people set during a time when safe spaces didn't really exist, the early 1950s. And it uses some language and attitudes of the characters that would be common now, but probably wouldn't be then. But it's a fantasy, it's fine. But what is interesting is that, so he was a police officer, and one thing that con constantly comes back to him is that people have been abused by the police within their community back at the time. And people don't trust him because he's a cop, because they assume he's one of them. And he tries to convince them, like, well, I'm not one of them, and then they'll pretty much come back with, well, did you ever stop any of the raids? Did you ever warn anybody about the raids? And he has to admit that he did not. And part of that is that he never really thought about a sense of community with other people queer people. And through the course of the mystery, he does get introduced to that because Lavender House is a place where a lesbian couple has lived. They have a gay son who for show is married to a woman, but is actually with a man who lives in the house with them. And his wife is a lesbian who's with another woman in the house. Pretty much any of the servants who live in the house are also queer, and that's part of the thing, because then they won't feel like they're going to rat out uh, the people who live in the house to the gossip papers or anything like that. So they have this safe space that they have created where they can all be themselves, but to the outside world, it looks like something other than what it is. One of the two matriarchs died in what appeared to be an accident. Her wife was not convinced it was an accident, so she hires this... He's now transitioning into becoming a private eye to look into it and of course he pretty much immediately decides it's not an accident so someone in this house committed murder and he has to figure out who and it's a fun book i liked camp which is the other book i read by this author much better but and part of it i think is that i'm just not really in a space for mysteries and thrillers right now and i thought this was going to be a fun mystery thriller and it kind of is but it's not it's not trying to have a sense of humor at all. So that was a little... But it was a good book. And I'm glad that I did read it. And I'm yeah. glad... I'm going to do it next, so... Well, I'd really like to know what you think of it. Yeah. And what you think of the Batman voice. Batman voice. <laughs> so that was the next one. And then I did Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. That was something... I've really wanted to read that for a long time anyway. And for my Santa Book Company's Reading Challenge for 2022, which you're already done with. Yep. I <laughs> I still have, I think, nine more books. And one of the prompts was a book that is a YA or middle grade winner of the Credit Scott King Award. And that fit for that. So I did it. I really liked it. I didn't realize it was a memoir. And it is. It's about her life growing up in the civil rights era and kind of in the South, but also moving to New York City and the different places. And it's very well written. It's also about her kind of activating her identity as someone who wants to be an author and believes that she can be an author. And that was really interesting. And then moving right along, I finished now in November. I did not think that I was actually going to finish this this month, oh, wow. but I had like 90 pages left. And one night we were going to bed and I just picked it up and I sailed through the last 90 pages. Really loved this book a lot. It is a Pulitzer Prize winner for fiction. It's part of my Pulitzer Prize project. Uh, you can tell because I have this Franklin Library edition of it. Not going to talk about a whole lot about it here because there will be a Pulitzer Prize deep dive coming. There will be a lot of interesting things to say about this book and about Josephine Johnson. She is the youngest person to ever win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. She was only like 24 wow. when she won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1935. And she wrote other books, but she never had the level of success that this one has. And I think there are a lot of interesting reasons why that may be the case. So we'll talk about it. And I won't spend a lot of time on it now. The only other book I finished in the month of October was Happening by Annie Ernaux, who just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. 
I've wanted to read one of her books for a long time because she's been sort of like in on the list or short list of people that have been predicted to win a Nobel Prize for Literature. And her work just sounded interesting. So once she actually won, I decided I kind of wanted to do it. And Happening was available. It was an hour and a half. And I didn't think I was going to manage to finish it. But I did. And it's fantastic. It's about her getting an abortion in 1963 and how harrowing that process was. And it's also a really interesting way of a memoir. Because it feels like she's talking to you directly about this experience. It feels very intimate and... Mm -hmm. Very well written, very well observed, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to reading another one of her books. And that was the last thing I read. In the month of October. There was nothing else for you in October, right? Nope, I'm done with no. October. Okay, so what are we going to do in November? Well, my next one's that big boy right there. <laughs> this big boy. <laughs> right here. Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. This was actually recommended to us by Abby Yep. From Montana Book Company. I think on Independent Bookstore Day back in April. So I picked it up. And Emily Damforth wrote The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which I read back in when we lived in New York okay. and enjoyed. And this, so this is her next book. She's a Montana author too. She is. So, so the reason <laughs> we're both going to read this this month or try to read this this month, it's, it's a lot is that the LGBTQ center here yep. in Missoula is starting a book club and we thought we would give it a try. And this was the book that they had picked. We joined late, so we didn't get to participate in the picking process, but it's something we actually have a copy of and it's on script. Yeah. So what's going to be interesting is we're, I think we're, we may both try it on audio, but there are footnotes in the book. I don't know if you can see that. And this footnote has an illustration. So it'll be interesting to yeah. see how they handle that in audio format. I, if it doesn't work for me, I might switch to the book book. But we're both going to try that for the book club. Yep. Yeah. So that's my next one. Yeah. And then, then, I'll, I'm, then I'll probably jump to Lavender House after this. Okay. Perfect. And then I'll see where I get because I have... Uh, I had already started Demon Copperhead this weekend. I got 50 pages in. I love it. I love it. I'm loving it so far. <laughs> so I did this to myself knowing that I wasn't going to finish it by the end of the month, even though I promised Erica from The Broken Spine that we would do a buddy read of Jane Eyre in November. So I'm going to be balancing both of these, at least for the first half of the month until I get this done. And then depending on how the audio of this one goes, I might pivot to that later and we try to get it just in time before we meet. This is funny because as Eric and I were talking, I realized I purchased this somewhere around 2001 or 2002. So this cover is really emo before <laughs> emo would have even been a thing. But so that's something I'm going to be doing in November as well. Oh, and I started an audio. Didn't nobody give a shoot about Carlotta by James okay. Hanahan. Loving that so far. So that's a, another thing that I'll finish. And other than that, I don't really have plans. What do you have other than Plain Bad and... Plain Bad, Lavender House, mm -hmm. and at that point, I don't know. Yeah, it's all... So I'm just going to see what take where it takes me. Footless um, I think friend. that's going to probably put me to mid-November. And uh, I think I might just dive into Christmas. It's going to be all Christmas. Yeah. I think we had told ourselves that when we got back, we were going to allow ourselves to just do Christmas. And we actually have slowly stepped our way into it still uh we went christmas shopping today for things <laughs> yeah i know but that's still it was slow it was fun <laughs> we're not like aggressively hitting other people <clears throat> no with christmas stuff so. so but now so we're filming this on sunday october 30th so halloween is tomorrow and then happy after halloween. that happy halloween and then after that, all bets are off. Christmas is everywhere. It's up. It's everywhere. It's on like Donkey Kong. It's on like Donkey Kong. So I think that's everything for October. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for a fun month. Well, thank you. And a fun trip. I had a great time. Yeah, me too. So we will check in with you at least at the end of November. We'll get Joel back. Otherwise, if there's anything in the meantime, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? And, uh, well. Nothing. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Sorry. Maybe we'll do a Christmas tour of the house once we get the household decorated. Oh, that would be fun. We also have plans for a new expanded Christmas village. Maybe. Yes. We'll see. I'm very excited about this. Me too. So we will leave it at that. Yep. And uh, just say thank you to you. As always, your time is really appreciated. And we will be back. Until next time, happy reading. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>